cuddles knock it off. Go! Hey guys, number one Marmaduke fan here. I lost my glasses, so I was in a panic and said, oh, I gotta clean my room, and I gotta clean my room blind now to find my glasses. So while I was trying to find my glasses, this literally fell through the cracks down to there. I found it with a big, thick layer of dust on it. So we're a uh, quick review of Anonymous Noise, and then I'll look at a couple uh, Western comics. So Anonymous Noise, Volume 15. The whole series is good. It's a pretty complicated love triangle. So start it from the beginning. Uh, it's a whirlwind romance with rock and roll. Uh, and the best thing about it is as the love triangle gets drawn out, from a writing perspective, the thing Ryoko Fukuyama is brilliant at is making sure you're very entertained and invested while she's dragging out that love triangle for everything it's worth. So I... Uh, Mo, uh, Nino got together with Momo and then it wasn't working out. She was losing her voice. So Momo broke up with her so she could find herself and stay true to her singing. How self-sacrificial. So after doing all that work to find Momo again, Nino's single and the band is back to doing concerts and their first anime single, which is kind of interesting because they have the, she has the band do different kinds of things. She'll have them do a rock concert, then she'll have them do an anime single, then she'll have them do like a uh, duet with another popular band. She really is getting into like lots of different neat things about trying to become a hit indie band in Japan. So I highlighted this scene because this scene sort of captures everything that Anonymous Noise has been so far. I talk a lot about how there are scenes that uh, I like, even though they probably weren't intended to be hilarious, but I hate the idea of liking something ironically. I, I never pretend to like something. If something is goofy, I like it sincerely, even if it's something that other people might like ironically. And I highlighted this scene because I feel like this is a good illustration of what I'm trying to talk about. So... Nino is talking to a pretty boy from a popular punk band named Girless, and he seems to be giving her some good advice on how to be a professional in the music industry, but it also seems like he might have some ul ulterior motives, like maybe he's in love with Alice, maybe he's trying to get in her head and prove that, he's, that she'll never be the uh, rock and roll star that he is, but he gives her... Uh, this advice on what do you do if one of your band members seems to have lost all confidence in themselves. He says, smack them. And she says, yeah, but what if that doesn't work? Then what? Smack them over and over until it does work. I mean, that's the type of person you are, isn't it? And then it zooms in on her all doe-eyed and she's thinking, I'm positive. He holds the key to moving us forward as a band. <laughs> I love it. All right. So the reason I highlighted this is this works on like three different levels. No, number one, it works on the straightforward level. She asks for advice, and the gag is he gives her kind of this dumb but straightforward advice. Just If somebody on your band is having trouble, just smack them. And if that doesn't work, keep doing it over and over again. And she reacts like this is legitimately good advice, and she thinks it's a great idea, and she's in awe of this amazing advice. So it works on kind of like the weird, goofy, uh, Was this is this intentionally hilarious or unintentionally hilarious level, but it also works on a narrative level because she's coming to a realization on how to reach uh, Yuzu. And it works on a character level because this whole time Alice has been this very, uh, Alice is Nino, Nino is Alice. The, 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 her, when she's, the real girl is named Nino. When she's on the band, she plays the role of Alice in Wonderland for the band. But she always has had this blunt, very straightforward personality and some things fly over her head. So it's completely believable for her character that if someone gave her the advice of just smack someone over and over again, she would be in awe of this advice and take it completely seriously. So may maybe it was intentional a after all. Like, like the fact that I can read this over and over again and enjoy it for multiple different reasons. Uh, I don't know. Like it'd be really hard to write something this good on purpose. And then it's the setup for like a legitimate character moment. So this is the other thing Ryoko is very, very good at is she makes sure that if she sets something up for her characters, that it has some fulfillment or some punchline in the chapter. So the chap the punchline of the chapter is that Yuzu is a brilliant artist, but he gets in his own head too much. So uh, Alice takes the advice of just smack him, and then all three of the band members, independently of each other, come to the conclusion that Yuzu just needs a, a smack upside the head uh, at the exact same time because they, they can tell that he's about to get moody and into his own, uh, I don't know, emo, emo world. So that's their way of being a supportive friend. Great, great punchline. 
a lot of, a lot of neat stuff like they have a big show and uh, one of the major bands uh, has a catastrophe, so they get promoted from the medium-sized stage to the big stage, underscoring how they're kind of scrappy underdogs rising up the charts. Uh, there's neat, more continuing, you know, neat romance stuff. And there's like a neat Battle of the Bands thing where uh, Alice gets to do a duet. And as she's doing the duet, like the the girlish band member who seems nice, but also seems like he's secretly a bit of a jerk, wants to use it as a kind of opportunity to one up her and show her that, you know, she has no clue how how hard to rock compared to him. And for most of the song, she's barely uh, keeping up with him, except for one little moment at the end. So she gets one little moment where she kind of shines and stuns him with her voice. But for most of the song, she's clearly the least, less experienced, less hardcore rock and roll uh, roller of the two of them. So it's what's kind of neat is this balance of they're never 100% there. They're never on top of the game. They're never on top of the world. But you can always sort of tell that they're on their way to the top. They get their little moment of excellence as they're struggling to keep up with all these other bands. So fantastic series. Uh, we're going to make this quick. So uh, Marvel Knights Daredevil, uh, story by Brian Michael Bendis, art by Alex Maliev. Uh, I've I've made fun of both of these creators at one point or another. Bendis is the author of the excellent Ultimate Spider-Man series, but I feel like in everything like post-2004, He's been trying to write for TV, and he isn't writing for comics. So big, it, it's an interesting idea, but it's an interesting idea buried in all of what's supposed to be kind of like folksy, down-to-earth, you know, rambling dialogue uh, that like people do in real life, but it doesn't work in comics. So this guy is rambling about how ever since superheroes showed up, uh, the mafia world just isn't the same anymore. It used to be you could just put out a hit on someone and people would know what it meant. Now you have to pay for all of these superhero villains in stupid spandex. And he wants to go back to the old days. And then he has uh, the Kingpin's men stab him in the back while quoting Julius Caesar. So the interesting idea is kind of like the un seedy underworld of Marvel Comics and these, you know, uh, Penny, Penny, Penny Annie thugs from the godfather trying to keep up in this superhero world which is kind of a cool idea but it's just so much build up uh alex Maliev's art i respect him but i feel like he uses he, I, I can kind of tell he's he's rely, heavily relying on photo reference and uh sometimes there's a bit of a stiffness so you, you can tell he's trying to bring some expressive line work into his work uh, there are some panels I think that are especially good later on that showcase that where he's bringing in some sort of like uh, well, panty shot, but also like cool like grain and texture and line work in into things. Uh, but then some of the poses will just be kind of like reliant on his photo reference. So I think he's a really talented artist. I, ju I just feel like a lot of his Marvel work, he's been I don't know, I don't know, not 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 pushing it. He, he isn't pushing the energy on some of the poses in this, but this stuff I like, I, this kind of gestural stuff, I think he should lean into that. Now, the, the Brian Michael Bendis problem is words, 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 and then it just ends with him, like, in the middle of a sentence and in the middle of a fight, the end. I don't think they should release, it'd be like releasing five minutes of a TV show as an episode you buy, even even for a $1 preview. Like, if the point is you have to read the whole story, I don't know, make a, make a $3 thicker preview that actually kind of leaves you off at a nicer ending point. Now, in contrast to that, uh, X-Men Moira McTaggart, it's a reprint of X-Men 96. This is something that has a complete little story in it and a whole bunch of other stuff. So Chris Claremont is the author. Dave Cockrum is the artist. Uh, I, I I know I read this comic when I was a little kid, but I wasn't paying attention to artists back then. So this is my first time looking carefully at a Dave Cockrum uh, comic. He has a really solid style, kind of in that classic Marvel style, little influence from uh, Jack Kirby and some of the machinery and the cool abstract stuff that shows up, little influence from John Buscema and kind of like these fluid, muscular uh figures i think but really just a uh, couple wonky panels but really really solid good old timey uh classic illustrator artist so it has a uh, cyclops grappling with the death of one of his men and basically feeling like a loser because he wasn't able to save his men uh, and i also like how every character or a lot of characters will have a little subplot in their lives 
given center stage for a moment, but that doesn't d distract from like the overriding thing. So uh, Wolverine has this moment where he's been trying to get this psychic training to control his rages. And then during the fight, he loses control and he cuts the monster into ribbons. So it feels like his training isn't getting him anywhere in stopping him from being an animal. Uh, Ororo Storm has like a flashback to her time as a street urchin uh, pickpocket. Uh, we This introduces Moira McTaggart, of course, but it actually doesn't make too big a deal out of it. She just sort of shows up and there's like a gag where Banshee suspects she's going to be like an 80-year-old crone and she shows up and she's uh, hot waifu material. So he's instantly trying to uh, like make her his uh, Scottish tomboy G GF. Uh, and, and, and then there's like also a neat subplot of like the government hating mutants and wanting to come come after them. And the, But in addition to all this, there's just like a plot where an evil demon shows up they fight the demon gargoyle. They beat the demon gargoyle. The end. That plot gets a beginning, middle, and end in the midst of all of these little subplots about these characters experiencing this stuff going alongside it. And Xavier kind of has this, I don't know, torturous psychic experience where the gargoyle messes with his mind. And it switches to, uh, what do you call it, kind of psychedelic uh, brain, brain fry style so fantastic that's not a very good face but overall an amazing uh, an amazing artist a great era of comics so much stuff happening so i'm not going to rip the daredevil comic but i am going to give it away and some lucky kid's going to get this x-men comic all right these this is going to the library this is going to the donation box i'm number one marmaduke fan i love you guys catch you later